Welcome again to your average traders. We've had a really busy week in terms of corporate earnings. We had news, we had stock market moves, and so we're going to go delve into some of it today. So firstly, we're going to talk about Tesla being the biggest news over the weekend. Firstly, we've had a mad move this week. I mean, and we've moved like 50% over the past three to four weeks. And this, you know, we, we closed above 1200 cement in its place as the fifth largest company by market cap in the US. And, uh, but what did Elon say over the weekend? <laughs> so it's a, it's a crazy tweet, you know, things were looking so good. It looked like Tesla had a rocket kind of up there behind in terms of the stock price, you know, maybe a potential capital squeeze, squeeze, squeeze yeah. happening. Elon's put a spanner in the works. Hey, yeah, this is what exactly. he said, basically. He said, much is made lately of the unrealized gains being a means of tax avoidance. So he proposed in selling 10% of his Tesla holdings. And he put it to a Twitter poll and he said he will abide by the results of this poll, whichever way it goes. And right now, with about three and a half million votes, which was the final result, 58% voted for selling 10% of the stock, 42% against. So what do you say to that? We've got Elon, who has around 240 billion of Tesla stock based on Friday's uh, uh, closing price. And he's got about 500 million of debt, right? So if he was going to sell 10% of his Tesla shares, it's not really just to clear off debt. Uh, so yeah, the debt that he has, uh, he takes his secured loans against his Tesla stock. Um, but, you know, when I think about this decision, right, I still think Elon is probably one of the best allocators of capital of anyone pretty much on the planet at the moment. And I think, you know, he's a servant to humanity pretty much all his biggest decisions um, are for some higher cause, right? You know, he's got Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, and the Boring Company. They're all trying to disrupt and trying to provide products and services that are an order of magnitude better than the incumbents. And he's also simultaneously advancing humanity. So he needs every penny he can get to go to Mars. Uh, so him selling these Tesla shares, which may be well, in my view, you know, probably in the next five years are going to at least double. Um, so, you know, it makes me think, what's his plan? I think it's, a, you know, a calculated move from Elon. You know, he pays for D chess. Uh, so he's thought through this whole scenario and he's probably discussed it with his whole group as well, right? You know, and uh, his brother sold a couple of hundred million yeah. dollars of Tesla just, stock on, just Friday. on Friday. So, just before he put out that yeah. tweet or so something, looks a bit dodgy there. I mean, I could have played yeah, better. Exactly. They could have played something better. Uh, you know, they could have played that yeah. better, should I say. I mean, it does look highly suspicious. Yeah. So, and also it might be Elon trying to temper the stock, you know, uh, with these meteoric gains, uh, you see, you know, the, the big crashes uh, coming. And I think maybe this is Elon's uh, way of kind of controlling it himself rather than the, the stock price being manipulated by uh, certain funds and market makers. I'm sure he's got a plan for that money. He's either speculating to put some into crypto or he's potentially going to create that school, Texas Institute of <laughs> Technology and Science, yeah. uh, which is but, uh, tits for short. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I do think, number one, he's got yeah. to a level of wealth where whether he's worth 300 or 600 billion, I mean, if it is to double, I don't think it bothers him if it's going to double or not. He's still going to have 90% of his holdings, number one. Number two, yeah. um, like I said, all of, many of these billionaires, they also, Jeff Bezos sells out, um, you know, sells out a billion a year to help fund um, Blue Origin and other ventures. You've got Bill Gates selling out for his Microsoft holdings. He's still one of the richest guys in the world, but he sold out such a big portion of his Microsoft holdings for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and all of his other ventures. Warren Buffett doing the same thing, allocating his wealth to philanthropy. So, and the thing is with Elon, first of all, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a bit off the top of the table, at the top, you know, taking a bit off the top, considering the move it's had. Tesla was, you know, the equivalent, I don't know what the equivalent was, but let's just say pre-split Tesla's like 6,000 right now. You know, I mean, literally two years ago, it was 200. So the thing is, it's been a me meteoric rise. And um, for him to take some off the table, I don't think anyone would say, you know, anything's wrong with that. And the thing is that, like you said, he's one of the best he would know what to do most with his wealth. And the thing is, yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, he let's just say, assume he managed to sell it at an average of a thousand a share, hypothetically. The thing is that with that cash, he can still, I mean, he'll have about 25 billion, let's say he pays 10 billion tax with 15 billion, he can do a lot. And I'm sure he's got a little, you know, his own little venture fund or something else he's going to do. Like I said, he can do crypto as well. And plus, 
you know, the politicians will be off his back a little bit. You know, his pain is due to the United States as being the richest guy in the world. And everything is about fair share. And the thing is that no matter what everyone says that a billionaire, they can take out the loans. You know, if I'm paying 30, 40%, and you know everyone else paying that much, and Elon doesn't have to pay anything because he hasn't sold his shares. Like everything's about the optics. It's just how does it look? Guys worth three hundred thirty billion, course. you know, and uh, he ain't contributing to American society. Apart, of course, he is for his company, but him personally, what's he doing? Yeah. Well, it's 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 the public who pretty much uh, decide the value of his company, right? They they're the ones that have uh, decided that it's worth this much you know you know 1.2 trillion you know when you think about it it's not like he's got this money just sitting in his bank account (laughs) it's just like you know your house going up crazy in value say if you lived in great areas in california or central london or whatever you know 20 years ago and then now your your property price is like 10 times right you know does it mean that you should sell a portion of your house now because it's worth so much more you know because you know people talk about it like oh my god he's actually got these billions right but he doesn't have these billions like you were saying before jeff sells you know billion a year to, to fund other things but i think with elon i think any idea even if it sounds pretty bad that he came up with you know i think he, people would be throwing, yeah, he, he could he, he, he doesn't need this money i don't think in terms of taking it out and i think he personally i'd prefer that he has more control over tesla i mean i know it's only 10 percent, but i feel like with all these other billionaires um you know they don't have that core mission behind them well whilst elon has you know he wants to get to Mars, right? And not just get to Mars, but get a million people to Mars and all of the stuff that's needed to uh, create a self-sustaining colony. And that is not going to be cheap, right? And it's not going to be uh, subsidized by governments pretty much. So he has to put every penny he's got to, to making it happen. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of mishaps along the way. Like spaceships, I said, I'm sure you know, there'll be plenty of people like that. that will join him yeah, for the journey. Definitely. So I don't think, yeah, of course, I of course. he'll obviously have the most amount of money to put in, but there'll be plenty of other backers. It's just too much. The thing is the way, the way yeah. you know, just as general, you know, like, the way I'm seeing it, this is just peak euphoria right now. The way some of these stocks are yeah, moving. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tesla's one added $400 billion to its market cap. Um, and then it's just it, insane. It's just, how many Tesla millionaires do you reckon have just been created is, you know, over the last so couple of weeks, it's just been crazy. Just, if you were in any of your, yeah. uh, like, you know, any of the, the out of the money options, uh, yeah, you know, you've just been printing tendies. That trading. There's two, you know, every big number, there's 200, 250,000 calls getting printed. I mean, trading every day and, and they all just getting paid. Like the one last Friday, wow, not this Friday, but the last Friday, I think it was, it was trading around 1190 and these calls just kept on trading and trading and trading and the last session, the, the part of the day, it just jumped up to like 12.15 and just, they all got paid. Because I remember I was looking at that, it was $4 to buy the 2000, uh, the 1200 call expiring that day and then ended up at 15 16 and closed that but it was mad the funds that were underweight tesla oh, yeah. uh and also the tesla shorts are absolutely over the moon with this news I, um, I half the people i'm pretty quite positive all the shorts yeah. united and said yes pay yeah. like 10 tax. yeah exactly they <laughs> yeah. yeah they they yeah, people were saying that they were paying for uh, votes, but I think Elon knew it's going to be a yes already. It was pretty much a given so when, he, when he, Musk. you know, asked the question. Yeah, yeah he, he, tra- what, he no, tried to he tried to make it into the. What would the, happen if we see another filing from Kimball Musk saying bought hundred million worth of shares at let's say nine hundred? <laughs> I'll tell you something. At you never know. I mean, yeah. he might he might want to buy back some of his stock. Um, but like, just you know, a few points on that. I'm sure the headlines are going to be all over that Elon is selling 10%. And I doubt that they're going to go more into depth about, you know, all of the mechanics behind it all. So like, I think now the momentum is going to be reversed in the stock uh, from the current euphoria. There's this great follow on Twitter. His name's Gary Black. He was saying that there are about 3 trillion active growth managers that are underweight by an average of 26%. And when you calculate that up, it's like about 30 billion in AUM uh, who'd like to buy Tesla at a discount, right? Uh, that's 25 million shares uh, of and potential that's, demand and that's the amount um, that, that could easily be buy. Selling. So there yeah. you go. You can I think, block yeah, <laughs> so yeah exactly. So we don't we, we don't know if it's going to go down. I mean, it's just the sentiment will be changed that he's oh he's selling, and I think that's going to obviously give these uh, give some. You know, if it does drop down into a thousand, I'm actually happy because you know uh, my selling puts trades uh, will 
yeah, become a lot better in terms of uh, risk to reward um, and also pick up a couple of more shares uh, at that price because I, I still think that the cur that current trajectory of that company is just is up and this is a little blip uh, and I think it's a it's a created blip by Elon. You know, he's taking it in his, into his old hands, like you know, like how he's opening up the superchargers up to other brands, right? Because he's doing it you know, voluntarily, because he knows that in the future, I'm sure the government's going to kind of mandate that they open it up, but he's doing it on his terms, right? Meaning, you know, he's, he's, he's doing it before he's forced to. And I think the same thing potentially with, you know, selling his stocks, uh, you know, it's maybe, you know, even potentially giving these other billionaires some kind of pause to think, oh crap, yeah. is this what I need to be doing as well? Otherwise, Start the uh, revolution. you know, I mean, like yeah, exactly, billionaire exactly. wealth I, since COVID has happened, yeah. billionaires have caught like, their, their wealth has gone up 300 percent it's it's the fed yeah. has pretty much accelerated the wealth of these billionaires and the, the, the point yeah, is definitely a lot of the progressives and the far left the, the whole point is all of this stimulus all of this and it's benefited the billionaires the most and their net wealths oh yeah definitely through the roof and why should they just all just sit there and sit on it you know it's not yeah it's but you know, if you think about it though it's not about the amount you know it sounds like oh a lot of money you'll have to pay 10 billion or whatever but that's it's nothing it's like no. uh i think i heard it the saying like you know it's like it's just like a lunch out for the government in terms of the amount of effect it's going to have for them i think it's more a public relations uh type exercise with this type of thing it's going to be all over the headlines and it's going to be potentially a good thing for him and you know we've seen uh, Elon Musk, the engineer, the CEO, the visionary, the business magnate. Um, now we're going to see potentially Elon Musk, the philanthropist who, you know, is going to do some char charitable giving with the money or something like that, maybe. But potentially if he could have, instead of selling his shares, he could have transferred his shares like um, Jack Dorsey did uh, with Square uh, into a charitable uh, trust so then he's not open to this tax thing but i think he wants to be seen to be you know yeah. giving back to the government but the government super inefficient i don't know how you know like the, <laughs> he just one of the stats that i read the uh, the other day was just crazy is that the, the u.s spends 409 billion uh dollars a year and 8.9 million labor hours on tax compliance right just on tax compliance right it's, it's just hugely no, the, inefficient I mean, I mean, you know the, it's, yeah, in the government it's crazy is one of the, it's, it's yeah. insane like i mean yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. It's just, you know, I'm just saying, like, in terms of, like, people think, oh, yeah, he's giving back, you know, it's going to all go to the people, but it's not going to the people. It's just going to be squandered on some other silly stuff, it's you know, like, optics. nothing, yeah. Exactly. But let's, exactly. Let's okay, okay, let's move on to NVIDIA. It's, I bring this up purely because it's had a Tesla-esque move. It's been parabolic in the last three weeks. Um, it's moved up somewhere in the region of um, around 50%. It was, it was actually around 200 literally three, four weeks ago, and it topped a high of, that hit a high of around 317, 318. And it's really, really gathering momentum on this whole metaverse play. So um, there was a Wells Fargo analyst, Aaron Rankin, who raised his price target on the stock by 30% from 245 to 320. And I think that was on Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday, he, uh, he raised that target. And NVIDIA on that day was up as much as 17% at one point, which was mad. And he knows that we got NVIDIA's event, GTC 2021, happening on the 8th of November, which is tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Yeah. So, um, and he expects NVIDIA to officially launch the general availability of the Omniverse Enterprise and also such potential NVIDIA's Omniverse to serve as a key platform enabler for the development of the metaverse. So, um, it's been pretty meteoric, the rise in NVIDIA. What do you say about this? Is fifty percent move? Is this getting overdone? Is this being blown out? It, it just seems to be peak euphoria. I've said it before, but I mean, yeah. you know, these, these ain't small companies. This ain't like a one billion dollar company going to one and a half billion. This is a five hundred mm -hmm. billion dollar going to seven hundred and fifty billion. I mean, these mega caps are just adding on market cap like it's just child's play. And it's how much money must be just really swinging is. around, pushing everything up. It's just just mind boggling, you know, it really is. It really is. Yeah. I mean, uh, what they're saying, the velocity of money is, uh, kind of slowing down at the moment. Um, and like, what, what in terms of the NVIDIA CEO, he was saying something along the lines of like the meta universe is going to be a new economy. That's 
larger than our current economy or something like that. I think it's really, you know, it, yeah, it, it, that is really hype. You know, I, I, I don't know if, we've I mean, obviously close, NVIDIA, we'll be, AMD. Yeah, we've got yeah. close friends. We'll be coming on to the pod soon, crypto expert. And, you know, talking about Web 3.0, you know, the whole, uh, you know, I saw one of these, an ARC analyst actually say that, in the future, you'll be buying more digital t-shirts than real t-shirts to dress your digital self in the metaverse. And, and for me, you know, maybe I'm too old, but this just, this just seems absolutely bananas, but is, is this the new way? Is this the way that we all can be living in the digital universe, sitting on our chair while we live in some fantasy alternate reality, you know? Yeah. I mean, who knows? I mean, I think it's, everyone's really bullish on nvidia for the metaverse but i don't see like it's clear cut that they're going to be the winners you know um if it is like you know in terms of their chip business you know apple don't use their components right and they could be the leader you know one of the leaders in that metaverse even though they're not pushing themselves to be right you know they're working on ar and uh uh, those type of experiences you know for a long time it just hasn't hit the mainstream i think right now there's just this narrative that you know nvidia is going to be there but really are they I, I don't think the metaverse is just about the form factor that you've you know you've got on your head you know it could be through your phone or through uh you know other experiences as well but i'm just thinking is nvidia or amd the play you know i think potentially well, I mean, they right can now, be it disrupted, is the you know? for that trade you've obviously yeah. got some of these other smaller companies that are moving up on the whole hype but the thing is um i, I look at it purely at the moment as a trading point of view and i see yeah. mm-hmm. a stock like nvidia pretty much so we we look back we go october the 13th or you know mid-october basically we're trading at 206 it topped out at 315 i think um uh on friday and we actually had a nice topping tail over here a strong technical reversal pattern now the question is is it you know i mean look at that move that just looks like a blow off top the topping tail over here and now um, it will be interesting because we have the announcement. Uh, we have the actual event tomorrow. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Let's just see what they actually come up with. The real question is, These, what uh, is the future? Yeah. So, you know, obviously those that are, you know, they're helping on the whole idea that, you know, everything's digital. We Like we mentioned last time, Roblox, I'm not Roblox, Chipotle offering virtual burritos on Ro- Roblox and stuff like that. But... I don't know. I, I'm a bit of a skeptic, but then again, you know, am I am I thinking like videotapes? You know, is this are we living in videotape world, and is this is the whole digital MP3, and you know, going forward? Yeah, it's hard to tell. But you know, if I had to buy yeah, more digital like, who's, t-shirts, who's going to be the? Yeah. If I had to buy more digital like, t-shirts, just... real t-shirts, oh, man, that's just sad for me. Yeah, no, but, the, the, but I think I'm more bullish on say as yet unknown uh, entity that is going to be established that creates these these worlds, right? It's like, in terms of the metaverse, I'm actually so much more bullish on a potential upstart coming up uh, in terms of creating the actual world itself, you know, it being more of a software thing than a hardware thing, if that makes sense, right? It's not like NVIDIA is like creating these worlds, right? And that's where the real money is. You know, if you look at uh, these, like say, crypto games, uh, like Axie Infinity, uh, creating huge amounts of wealth and loads of people playing that and generating wealth, um, as well as, you know, games like Roblox and, you know, these immersive worlds, I believe that they're going to be more valuable than the actual hardware makers, you know, in the same kind of vein that, you know, how Microsoft is way more valuable than Intel, right? It's not about the hardware. And I think, yeah, that that's potentially the next direction. But I, I still think that NVIDIA is probably going to go to a trillion. Uh, there's just so I much mean, momentum I mean, behind it. And yeah. we'll see. Let's just see what they say on Monday. You know? the, I, it, it's come to a point where, I mean, I was looking at their yearly forecast for their revenue, 25 billion. I mean, it is ridiculously expensive. But, you know, what? one thing we know well, from this growth? market. Where's the growth? That, but this one thing we know in this market is just that when when a stock gets a win, tail, a tailwind behind it, they just go. It it. I feel valuations are now like yesterday's game in this current market. Like there's things that, I mean, it makes no sense on a valuation basis. Like they're literally pricing in growth 30 years into the future. And that's what you're paying for. Yeah. The thing, you just, just where is that? Where's the growth coming from? That's the thing. We'll, we'll see tomorrow what yeah, they, yeah, what their plan yeah. is. Um, but like from, from even so, I mean, if, you, if I had to kind of stretch my imagination. Estimate 25 billion yeah. next year is 29 billion. So that's about 14% growth, 15% growth. On the yeah, top it's, line, it's does that it. command a yeah. revenue multiple of 50, 60 times right now? 
yeah, exactly. Since, yeah. since, since. And then you compare you compare that to like say something like Tesla, and you can just see like massive growth ahead of it. You know, like it's just in this it's in the startup section of its growth curve, right? Uh, whilst you know, Nvidia. I mean, I, I just can't see that massive growth. But again, let's just see. You know, stop. We, do, we don't know how it's going to. Yeah, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. see how it goes. I mean, it just it shows the, the momentum uh, is with them at the moment. But I, I don't know if it's going to be sustained. But yeah, that's just my call. So let's now take a look at the flip side and something you know that's got absolutely hammered, and that's Zillow. Zillow wants the darling, and it, it, firstly with Zillow, it blows my mind that a company that seems to have people the, the amount of traffic they have going onto their website is unreal it's something that it's just it's it's like when you say i'm going to google something it's like i feel like in the states it's like oh, i just go on zillow and you check i'm just gonna go on zillow and you know you've got other competing ones but zillow is the and how i just it, the amount of data they have and what they end up doing well first of all let's just go through they report their third quarter earnings and they report a net loss on a gap basis of 328 million compared to a profit last year revenue fell well shy of consensus now the thing is that there have been some rumors that they're going to wind down their zillow office operation and they confirm that in this earnings release and they will take several quarters to to wind it down and they're going to cut their workforce by approximately 25 percent so just for those of you who don't know, Zillow, Zillow Office was an automated AI-based, um, you know, Zillow would make office for houses. And a lot of the time, it seems like they sort of overbid for a lot of these houses. But I think little did they price in the current environment, which just seems bizarre in this current world, where it's so plain to see the supply issues that are happening, the rising prices of lumber, how hard it is to get materials uh, and all of this. But yet they thought they were going to buy these homes, flip them, sell them for a profit. And the thing is now that they've left with a crap ton of inventory that they're going to, they're now packaging together to get rid of. And, um, and, it's, it's just going to cause huge loss. And because of that, we saw a 25% decline in the stock. It, it, it's a remarkable decline. And just quickly, the last couple of things, there. fourth quarter EBITDA, they're expecting another quite a sharp loss and revenue does expect to pick up and ahead of their uh, expectations. And the thing is about Zillow, the thing is, is that their core business is still doing good, right? So, um, but the thing is that this is really going to have a, pretty much a strong, you know, big bearing on their business. And just, just one tweet that I saw, again, it seemed like it was true. He goes that I just sold my house via Zillow office. I can't remember the Twitter handle that was um, mentioning it, but he sold his house for 550,000. And one week later, Zillow called him up and said, would you buy it back off us? And he offered 350 and they accepted. So this guy wow. sold his house. For 550, one week later, he bought it back for 350. And I mean, management, I mean, this has got to go down as one of the worst management mishaps. It absolutely just blows yeah, my mind. For a while, yeah, definitely. I mean, it just shows that how the actual mechanics of buying and flipping houses is very much a kind of a, a local based thing right you know you can't do it on a macro scale just sitting in some kind of central location and uh just looking at estimates and uh you know trying to base everything you know on google street view you know you, you have really no context in terms of like you know what type of neighbors that there are and you know uh, what other issues there are uh, underlying and they, they try to you know make this all into an automated thing and it just shows that you know the market's not really ready for that yet then when you compare it to um the other competitors like open door yeah. uh, the zillow had like a three to four percent uh, margin on their houses uh you know that's what they were calculating whilst open door have about 10 percent. so you know that's you know all it takes is some kind of unexpected repair bill or whatever um for zillow and you know you're underwater whilst uh open door you know have a have a larger um margin there to play with uh, we'll see how it goes it's now it's actually a, a bullish thing if open door and all of those guys they carry on you know it just shows that uh it's just a really bad execution from zillow someone was saying i think it was me kevin in terms of the incentive structures on um the zillow employees there were they kind of incentivized yeah, to close yeah. as many deals as possible or was it something along the lines of uh just just bad bad data for them and they were just told to accumulate as many properties as possible at whatever prices because uh the market is only trending up so you never know i mean they might be able to dispose no, I, of these I assets the at a higher price i think but... the idea is right, it just execute really yeah. badly i think they just went too fast too quickly um they paid way over the odds 
Um, and the thing is that they, you know, probably they were behind some of the market madness, you know, uh, and, and some of the offers that these people were given, like well over asking price. I think they just went in way yeah. too hard, and you know, they paid the price. And also, they were, yeah, they they were kind of competing against their main business because their their, their main business is just the real estate brokers, right? You know, to advertise on their site, um, and they were kind of competing against them as well in terms of buying in you know, these houses and trying to flip them. Yeah. So th that wasn't great from a kind of PR point of view in terms of their actual main uh, customers, right? You know, they're kind of competing against them. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's good to see hopefully that, you know, the market will call a little bit uh, and then reset uh, to uh, was from inevitable think, higher highs, right? Uh, you know, but I saw that Kathy Wood, she sold out of all of it. She, she, she bought it as she always does after these earnings. Um, she bought, um, some did it prior to the earnings on the initial 11% dip prior to the earnings. And then the, after the earnings, you just bailed out. But, you know, I bought a little bit just because not just because I think that maybe, you know, I can just bring down, I had it, I was long before and I just started to bring down my average a bit. It's not a massive position. I think, you know, what I was, I was 65, you know, it was 200 at one point, not saying it's going to get back there, but I thought, you know, um, just delve in, went the opposite of Cappy, but, you know, let's just see what happens. All right, okay, so cool. another stock that took a real beating this week is Peloton. Um, another, that one, 30 odd percent, 33 percent down day. And again, on the back of some real bad earnings and supply uh, constraints, which has been one of the leading factors in a lot of these companies. But um, let's just delve into Peloton right here. So with Peloton, they reported a loss of $1.25, which was more than expected, and revenue was roughly in line. But what really set the market back was their second quarter guidance, which was well below consensus. See their margins dropping to 24%, a bigger loss. And it, it really was just a real disaster of an earnings for Peloton, which was once the darling. And now we've seen the economy open up, more people going to the gym. Is this the end of the the honeymoon period for Peloton, you know, we've, we've always, we've seen in the past, they've had the issues with their treadmills. They've had to do a recall on their treadmill. There was a unfortunate fatality involved in one of their treadmills. And then they've seen softening demand for its exercise equipment and ongoing supply chain challenges. So the thing is, it's, it's been a bit of a rough one for Peloton. It's now trading at below $60. And it was just about 120 not that long ago. So it's been pretty, it's not, not been a good one, you know. So what do you think? Do you think this is the end? Is this the, I mean, do you think Peloton is still have legs in the fitness market? I mean, as in the growth probably is not going to be the same as it was obviously during COVID, but it's, I, I, we use Peloton all the time. So I can't see it going anywhere pretty soon, but definitely it seems to be um, the brakes have been put on stock for sure. Definitely. I mean, now it's like trading at a market cap of uh, below 17 billion. Like, you know, is this what its value should have been at all the time? I mean, it obviously had this really premium experience uh, with their equipment and they had that mind share of if you wanted to work out at home, uh, get a Peloton. And I still think that's still going to stay there. But it's just maybe, you know, the market is now pricing in what they believe the future growth of the company is going to be. I think this is where the company should be valued at the moment on my rough calculations. Trading, I mean, this was, this is where they were playing trading prior to earnings, 86 bucks. And then, I mean, it was just a bit of a brutal one. And that, and I mean, we've seen now with snap Peloton Zillow that if the sky high growth company, you know, the sky high price growth company, just disappoint one bit how the market will punish them because there's so much fluff in a lot of these valuations. And we're seeing it right now on an individualistic level with Peloton. We saw it with Snap last week. And, and, and the thing is, it's just the market, although it's very generous, you disappoint and you don't show that growth that they wanted. And this is it. You just get absolutely punished. And the question is, is it's, it sort of just shows that this is why it's making me a bit nervous to be so long. Like, I, I, I'm, you know, I sold out more this week than I've ever done in any other week. I, I've trimmed back on so many names. I've not, I, I've seen so many earnings this quarter and I've never seen so many revenue misses, so many guidance um, that's <laughs> been cut, like relative to what there has been in the last four quarters. And I'm really starting to see a shift change. And, you know, a lot of them saying supply constraints, um, but, 
you know, I, I just there's too much that have been pumped into the stratosphere, and, and you're really starting to see now a lot of these companies that are struggling to reach, you know, to, to stay up with the numbers that the analysts, you know, which are normally gimmies for them, you know. So I, I'm starting to see it slowly, slowly shift. But while we're still being supported mainly by these fan names, which are all still trading higher, um, it's I, I'm starting to see between the cracks. Yeah, yeah. Let's just see how all the printed money. You know, does it buy the dip uh, eventually, or you know, uh, are we going to get some kind of sense? But every time we say that there's going to be some oh, kind of sense, that's the whole point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Fed did taper this week. You know, they're much, uh, mm-hmm. and the thing is that they tapered 25 billion, I think it's 15 billion in bonds and 10 billion in MBS. I think I can't remember off the top of my head, but the thing is that the markets took it on a stride and just went up again. And, and pretty much we've had like 18 straight days up for the NASDAQ. It, it doesn't seem like any of this is stopping anything in this tracks at the moment. So, you know, and, and but the thing is that in terms of, we're talking about Peloton being an at-home story, same like Zoom, but we did see Pfizer report and then now some pretty um, market moving uh, announcement in terms of their new COVID pills. So I just wanted to talk about Pfizer just momentarily. So Pfizer reported mm-hmm. strong results and they as you can see, they beat on the top and bottom line, they raised their outlook and they clearly are the winners of the COVID vaccine game. As in like they are so. making incredible amounts of money with their COVID vaccine. I think the year revenue forecast is well above 20 billion compared to with any other ones that they're, they're well and truly above uh, the, the rest when it comes to um, that aspect of their business and there was two big news events for Pfizer this week first of all the cdc acip panel voted unanimously to recommend their vaccine for children aged 5 to 11. so that was one uh, big news and second one was a new covid 19 pill which is an antiviral treatment candidate reduced the risk of hospitalizations or death by 89 percent um, in an EPIC HR study, the first oral antiviral of its kind. And we actually got a quote from one of their execs saying that COVID-19, as we know it, is now over. So, firstly, how quickly do we get back to normal? I think most places are back to normal, but like you look at the Far East, there's still lockdowns left, right and centre. When is it the world is going to get back to normal? Is this pill the solution? Is it going to work? We also saw the Merck pill as well. It's, um, we had a massive move firstly on Pfizer. It moved up about 10% on the announcement of that pill. And, and on the back of that, we saw Moderna trade down like 25%. Moderna was 400 not that long ago, We've traded to a low of like 212, and now it's like 235. We saw all the COVID names all trading sharply lower. BioNTech, which is their COVID vaccine partner, they also took a massive hit. Um, so it's it seems like Pfizer is definitely just winning the race in terms of the what's needed for combating COVID. And bear in mind, they were, they were one of the companies that did not take government money, you know, government funding as part of yeah. their warp speed program. It was it's all on their own. And now yeah. they're reaping the benefits. <laughs> but in terms of yeah, in terms of stock price, you know, like it kind of gapped up from forty three odd to forty eight, which is kind of where they were trading at, you know, mid August anyway. So uh, it's it's not like any kind of new uh, all time highs, although it's close. Yeah, we have to see. Hopefully, uh, this is the end of COVID as we know it, especially. Uh, around the areas that I'm in, you know, you don't see too many uh, masks at all. Um, even at big gatherings, um, you know, there, there's there's hardly anyone. Uh, you know, pretty much everyone I know who is vulnerable has had, you know, their booster jabs. So, you know, three uh, in total. And, and they're all kind of confident that if they do get ill, you know, there will be some kind of treatment for them. Yeah, that, that's the kind of outlook. Uh, but we'll see as we go into the, the deep winter. But I think there's, a, you know, as we spoke about before, there's this real uh, sense of kind of COVID fatigue and everyone's just yeah, everyone's you know, in their normal life I, now. I, I think generally yeah. in terms of people's behavior, especially in the West, um, and especially here, like in the New York area, um, we're seeing a lot more, you know, I mean, just everything just back to normal. But the real question is, yeah. what is the work, at, what's the work situation going to be like? Are the offices still going to start to be filled up? Uh, you know, we, we had announcements from Amazon and Microsoft that indefinitely postponed, um, you know, going back to the office, like, is that going to change now? Or is this just the new normal? Obviously, I think there's going to be a lot more work from home. But I think the real places that are struggling is still with the lack of these offices being filled. And then you just your 
your sandwich shops, your coffee shops, there, there's no line outside. Yeah. Like, if, I mean, that, that's the rule. Yeah. What did you, what was your activity like this week? Did you do much this week? You do much? I think I sold like four uh, forty five dollar um, interest. interest. Yeah, uh, yeah. Course, yeah. That's so the I, I took the game. Yeah, no, yeah, so. I, my, my whole yeah, that was an easy. That was an easy grant. You know, yeah. just there. Uh, no, because so, yeah, my yeah. reason behind it was, I mean, they got absolutely battered. We all, we mm -hmm. we knew that they, um, you know, they took the massive hit in the prior quarter, and so I did take a flyer on um, on that one, and then that one worked out. All, right. all yeah. I just wanted, I didn't even care to win up, just just didn't want it to collapse. And we've seen some of these moves. It, you know, one of the most fortunate things I had was that I was actually short um, some Peloton puts. And what happened when it just before earnings, it went up to 94. And then, you know, there was a decent, you know, there's about 30% return, 35% return. And I just went, you know what, I'm just gonna take that. I'm not risking this into earnings and, and thank the Lord, because I don't think there's any way I could have rescued it really um, if, if I held it, so uh, I got lucky on that one, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that's rough. Well, I'll say, you know, I sold a few uh, Tesla puts, uh, you know, in the 900 range, uh, which, you know, I'll be happy to be assigned, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. And um, also I started long position in uh, Teradyne, um, and yeah, that's up 20% already. So that's, that's just crazy. This market is just insane. Like said, um, I've just been trimming, I've been long a firm from like 110 and it's like 163, 164. Yeah. And, and the thing yeah, is that definitely. Peloton offers a firm and, and, and you know what it is? Again, it just, I feel like some of these stocks have just gone up too much, too fast. I was on Silvergate, um, SI, and that's had a mad run. And I just went, cause I, I think I got in around, um, again, I need to check again, but like around the 130s or 140s and it went up to 210, 220, you know, as a, as a like a, a Bitcoin, type play um and i think a lot of people are now signing silvergate as a bitcoin play to play in the stock market rather than going by cryptos direct so the thing is that 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 ended up being good so a lot of these um stocks that have just had these mad runs in the last few weeks i've just trimmed a lot off and amd yeah i've got in at 100 and and it sort of moved up with nvidia and again just pretty much just got out of it because the thing is I've seen, uh, you know, this year, my, my biggest problem was when these quick gains happen, um, I didn't take them, then it retraces, and then eventually it might go back up there again. But when, when a quick thing happens, it's just like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just out because the thing is, we've seen how quickly they can correct. And we've seen it during the year. And the thing is that, am I premature right now? It's mid November. We could probably rally until the end of the year, but I, I just think some of these things have just happened too quick, too fast. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I, I'll take the hit on. I, I, I'll just take out some of this, and I'd rather just have a, a bit of firepower. And like I said, eighteen days in a row, and the Nasdaq have been up. Uh, it it just it just seems. I don't know. It, I'm looking at the earnings. I'm looking at the fundamentals. They're not matching up. The stock price movement and the fundamental. They're just not matching up at all. And the thing is that that's what's led me to sort of uh, trim trim quite a bit. But we'll see. Probably be wrong. So, you know. We'll see. <laughs> Well, yeah, let's see how it goes. I mean, like, I'm I'm interested in the Rivian, Rivian IPO. Uh, you know, they're shooting for I think about sixty four billion valuation or something like that. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see. You know, they have a shot to be kind of like the number two EV pure play. Um, and I think Rivian One RT is a uh, is a great truck, but I think there's obviously a limited market for something like that. Uh, it's it's a great kind of outdoor truck you know for for those uh, adventurers but in terms of like you know haulage capacity and you know all of that it's not built for for work as much you know as uh, some, something like the f-150 uh and f1 uh, f-250 350 etc you know that really do the the, the, the pure work uh, angle um so what's really missing is these electric trucks right you know that deliver everything right and i think as long as they they focus on that uh, which amazon is forcing them to do uh, I think, you know, they're going to have a really strong um, uh, play in, in terms of that on the, on the EV side. Uh, so hopefully, you know, they can they can be the go-to for, for that type of truck. But I think Amazon's going to pretty much buy up every one of their, their vehicles for the next couple of years anyway, uh, in terms of the that um, delivery truck. So, so it'll be, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting because, I mean, their, their initial IPO range, I think, was around, again, I think it was 57 to 62, and now it's bumped up to now 68 to 72, although I have to check those numbers, but 
the thing is, it's going to be a hot IPO. Um, again, you know, Tesla's led the way. Not buy at this type of yeah. price, though. The thing is, the Tesla's yeah. led the way for these mad valuations. You know, we've had this big um, move up in Lucy that we briefly touched upon last week. You know, they they mm -hmm. start the deliveries for their cars, and so Lucy's back at around forty. And um, I mean, you, even Ford, geez, Ford is. Ford has had one hell of a run as well. <laughs> you know, it's now trading at mm -hmm. eighteen nineteen, which is like one of the it's like the highest it's been trading, I think, in a long time. So, and the thing is, Ford have a, I think a ten percent stake in Lucid. Amazon has a I'm not Lucid, Rivian twenty percent stake is from Amazon. So thirty percent stake is from these two um, um, automakers, and and um, it, it'll be very. Yeah, I think it's smart from yeah. Ford. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Ford has kind of got their the basis covered in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, um, F 150, uh, kind of market, right. You know, they, they've got a stake in, you know, they've got their hands in the pies that are going to compete with them anyway on that, on that, apart from Tesla. So we'll see, uh, it's, it's really, uh, going to be an interesting time, but you know, we're seeing uh, reports of, uh, BMW removing touchscreens in many of their models, which is just, uh, insane you know uh I, I tweeted that you know if it's it's, it's 2022 would you still buy, would you buy a, a premium uh sedan or suv uh without a touchscreen in 2022 <laughs> it's it's yeah i mean i understand they've got supply chain shortages but you know one thing i one thing i don't want them to do is um to kind of over produce as soon as those um supply chain issues are resolved because you know they'll be flooding a market which is slowly evaporating in terms of the internal combustion engine, right? I mean, I'm not saying the market is, is dead, but you know, it's, it's slowly declining. And, uh, you know, last thing they want is more inventory than they can handle. So in a way, I think this, this type of supply chain thing is potentially, you know, uh, creating more demand for their vehicles and they can sell for closer to list price rather than the discount model that they, you know, normally offer. Um, and uh, hopefully keep their profitability up, uh, while they transition, while they try to transition to EV. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, as you guys know, I'm in the market for the, the Mackie. And the thing is that, um, you know, I'm talking to the sales rep. And he was going, in the best case, that the maximum discount we're allowed is $150. <laughs> you know, <laughs> on a 50 something grand car, you go, here you go, mate, here's 150 bucks. <laughs> because that's yeah, the yeah. max discount that's allowed on this car. I was like, okay. So, yeah, so you know, like you're saying, it's helping yeah. selling their cars uh, near their, you know, the actual p um, price. And um, so, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, to get any EV right now, yeah. it's tough. It's tough right now. So yeah, it is. But the thing is that they'll hold their value um, pretty well. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the Mackie, the Tessas, especially, you know, you, you probably buy one of those and, and, and not lose anything really uh, much on it, even though the production is just going through the roof. It just seems like demand is just uh, crazy. In the UK here, it's the best selling car, period. Um, you know, not just EV, it's, it's the best selling car period uh it, it, like the demand is insatiable uh your resale values are pretty much you know a two-year uh tesla is selling for around the same price then obviously there's been price increases um uh, since it launched but um, pretty much you know a two-year-old tesla with a you know five to ten thousand miles is selling for the same price that uh, uh it listed for in 2019 which is just insane uh yeah so let's just see how, how that continues um there's 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 a lot of money sloshing about. We're going to have Elon sloshing about yeah. with another 25 billion pretty soon, maybe. So it's, it's, um, yeah. you know, it'll be very interesting to see what happens, but, um, yeah, I, will. Yeah. I mean, like, do you have any predictions for the, uh, upcoming three months, uh, or any trades? You know, I was talking about, I was talking to some people the other day about this and since Biden got elected, it's been roughly one year. It has been on the index level, one of the most insane years. I mean, the S and P when Biden got elected, I think was around 3,200, 3,300. It is up almost 50% in one year, which is incredible. The NASDAQ even more. So that's, I mean, if you actually look at the year from the moment, November the 4th, Biden got elected to now, it's been crazy. And again, it's got nothing to do with Biden, but I'm just using that as a time scale because this is where we are. You know, all these presidents that go, oh, look at, you know, this is because of me, the stock market's gone up, it's got nothing to do with it. It's our friend Jay Powell keeping uh, policy loose. Yeah. That's, that's the main Exactly. That's the main it's thing. all up to him, right? And the thing yeah. is, again, oh. we're expecting the Santa Claus rally to the end of the year. Historically, 
the way the market is right now, it it does it seems like the path of least resistance is obviously up. There's no sellers, right? There is no sellers. But I tell you what, if any type of fundamentals come to any type of thinking anytime soon, we are going to call off a bit. I'm not saying we're going to crash. I think we're going to call off because you look at these earnings, you look at the amount of companies that are really not hitting the numbers, and but yet you see how much they've gone up. We've seen Apple, Amazon, but by the way, both of them are now trading above where they were prior to their earnings, which just shows, you know, it doesn't matter. Right, so yeah. Apple, Amazon, both of this, and yeah, you can say supply issues, whatever it is, but um, uh, Apple's back at 151, I think. Amazon's back close to three and a half thousand. Uh, uh, as in, the, right now, fundamentals don't mean anything, but if any type of fundamentals come back into play, I think we're going to start seeing a bit of a, we are overdue a, a bit of moderation to this crazy trajectory that we're on right now, where the NASDAQ, like I've said again, it's almost 18 straight days. It's just been up. If you just look at the NASDAQ, it's, it's literally a straight line up for the last 18 days. And it's, yeah. it's incredible. And, and maybe, you know, yeah, it really Elon is. Musk selling that 10% of his Tesla, maybe that that might start. Who knows? I don't know. It, it's it's going to be weird. But yeah, it's, okay. part of least resistance is definitely up. But I would not be surprised in the slightest if we start to moderate a bit. Definitely. I think the real inflation isn't CPI. The real inflation is in asset prices, right? You know, with all these trillions printed, pretty much that is what's getting inflated. And until, I don't know, it seems like still a huge amount of that is on the sidelines and until that's kind of exhausted, right? Or scared, right? And I guess people were scared of COVID returning uh, to the West in the in the winter, um, but the, the fears are, have been allayed. So well, what's your take on uh, Bank of England, uh, uh, you know, keeping rates flat? Yeah, well, there was two dissenters. Um... There is a lot of, the market obviously got ahead of itself. We actually had last week, the five-year gilt have the, a 25 basis point decline in one week, which I think is the biggest move that's been in, in a long time. And the thing is, I think the market was really getting ahead of itself um, in terms of its rate projections and the Bank of England tempered those expectations. There were a couple of uh, members that wanted to raise rates, but overall, I don't think, we've actually seen uh, the Polish central bank, the Czech central bank, both raised rates ahead of expectations. So you've seen it in emerging Europe. But the thing is that Bank of England has been one of the major banking, along with the ECB, Bank of Japan, Bank of Japan, having raised rates to eternity. But you see the US, and I don't think Bank of England were ready to be the first movers to start this rate cycle. So I think they clearly put the expectation that it's coming but they've massively tempered expectations on the rate of increase that is going to happen. So um, the, the, we were listening to their um, their conference following their rate decision. And again, the, the standard line from a lot of the members is that a lot of these are supply side constraints. It's going to be transitory. And uh, once the supply bottlenecks sort themselves out, inflation will die down. And that is the rhetoric from pretty much the Fed. Bank of England, uh, ECB members as well, they, you know, that is the narrative. And so if that narrative don't play out and just ain't transitory, then that's when the fireworks will start to happen. And the question is how they're going to adapt to it. Because the Bank of England did say, we're sorry for, you know, this rise in CPI. Um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit, you know, these energy bills over the winter, it's going to hit. It's, you know, like the way it, oil prices, like just to fill up my car, it used to cost me $28 to fill it up. Now it's 42, you know, and, and I don't even drive that much. Right. And the question is, is that, you know, these people doing it daily with their with winter coming up, it's, it, I feel like you're going to get a bit of a squeeze with a lot of this. So, um, yeah. transitory, I don't know, maybe some things are transitory, but I think what happens at CPI, just the biggest scam is CPI because it shows prices are not increasing, but it's, um, you know, the package is just cut in half. Like, you know, we just had Halloween, Halloween uh, last week. You know, the Snickers fun size is now literally turned into a little half inch by half inch square. <laughs> you know, before the fun size used to be about this big, and now it's like that. But, you know, but the price hasn't gone up, but the size has <laughs> it's gone to about a third of what it was before. So, I mean, yeah, you see, shrinkflation. Yeah, it's shrinkflation. Yeah. It's, in, it's inflation is through the roof, but the thing is that the actual prices of that good 
you know, this is what it is. Yeah, yeah everything just yeah, definitely. Short. The energy prices here have just gone through the roof. Yeah. You know, we've had a couple of bankruptcies due to, uh, you know, the UK getting screwed in terms of natural gas from Russia. Uh, yeah, so you know, you talking about your gas price going up. My, just filling up my Tesla used to cost me around nine pounds. Now it costs me fifteen pounds. So, uh, in in terms of electricity, uh, so yeah, it's it's going up for all of us. You know, one thing I really wish is that you know uh, nuclear wasn't as stigmatized as it is and has been. You know, looking at the countries that have a, a lot of nuclear, like France, they've got a great base load of electricity. And if more of the world had that, that would be like a way to hedge against these type of uh, huge fluctuations in uh, energy costs. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But, um, I think we can go yeah. on forever. There's been so much talking yeah. points uh, this week, but yeah. um, uh, we're going to call it here. But I uh, hope you enjoyed yeah. the content. Please subscribe and like. As it will yeah. to YouTube. Uh, yeah, and leave like what they say. <laughs> Yeah, let us know if there's any type of topics you want to discuss, any stocks that you want us to cover. Raj can do some uh, deep dive, uh, uh, you know, technical analysis on those. And yeah, we're really looking forward to the next one, which will hopefully be with our crypto expert. So yeah, I will look forward to seeing you on the next one.